I want to start off by showing you a uh, few slides that will speak for themselves. <laughs> this is the fundamental problem we're dealing with. The uh, <laughs> process of music notation is far from perfect. The uh, process requires an editor, and everybody knows you start an editor off by inserting notes. And uh, here is a case of over-insertion, if ever was. Uh, that's, that's deletion. And for those of you who are familiar with text editors, you all know that justification is a <laughs> serious problem. There are various solutions to the justification problem. <laughs> there are also, of course, the usual scaling problems, and uh, here we see a... Uh, <laughs> an instance of that. There are also various solutions to that problem. Here is a clef switching. <laughs> This doesn't handle everything. There are certain cases that are really extreme. <laughs> How many hands for it? Three friends. Uh, those slides were stolen from a book by a fellow by the name of P.D.Q. Bach, otherwise known as uh, Peter Shickley. Uh, he's a... Uh, great plagiarist himself, as a matter of fact, and uh, what you might call a uh, one of the mortals of modern music. <laughs> okay, well, uh, our goal is to try to build a program that will let us capture musical ideas and uh, edit them and put them down uh, eventually on paper. Uh, with less effort than is presently required. I'm particularly interested in the, problem, uh, the problems faced by composers, uh, as opposed, for example, to the problems placed by, uh, faced by people who want to reproduce music, uh, that is, perform it, or people who want to publish it. Uh, although some of the work we've done, as you will see, clearly has implications in both those areas. Uh, what we've been doing is strictly an experiment as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the question is, as it says, can we do better than the pencil and paper that composers presently use and the various shorthand methods that they use? Uh, the idea was predicated on the notion that it's easier to play music on a keyboard instrument, at least a rough skeletal sketch of it, than it is to write it down because the writing process is very, very slow. And in fact, here's an interesting set of facts, approximate facts, like most facts. Uh, I found that out by doing it, and uh, Dave Liddell confirmed my, my ratio of six for the first thing. So if you're sort of faced with the, the business of writing music as, as opposed to the business of writing text, you're ten times worse off than the guy in the street who's going to write text. Well, you might say, who cares? There are not that many people that write music. Well, the few that do care a lot. Uh, a composer's... Uh, composer's lifetime output is measured in, uh, in hours of actual music, and it takes them a whole lifetime to write that stuff down. And that seems like a bad deal to a uh, composer anyway. Uh, so uh, I have particular knowledge about this because my dad is a composer, and that's probably how I got interested in this in the first place. Uh, I'm just an amateur musician myself. But uh, I've watched my father struggle for a lifetime trying to write down music, and uh, I know from reading that, uh, that this is a serious problem, and anybody who's ever tried to write music knows that uh, writing it down is a hard job. And music goes along at its own sort of pace. You don't get a chance to think of it a little slowly here. It take 20 minutes to think through this three-minute section. It just goes at its own natural pace. And there it goes in one ear and out the other, and you haven't got it on paper yet. So. Uh, I've been concerned with making it much easier to speed things up. And uh, my, my dad is, is a fine pianist, and so he doesn't have any trouble playing the things that he wants to, uh, wants to write. Very often I've heard him play things that then uh, disappear into the air and are never captured again. 
but I thought maybe his problem was unique. So last fall, I went around and I talked to a number of composers to see whether the problems that they were facing were sort of the same. Most of them said that uh, they themselves write with using the piano as an instrument, but that nobody else does. <laughs> and uh, I talked to Aaron Copeland, I talked to Leonard Bernstein, I talked to Samuel Barber, uh, a variety of people. And uh, they all, uh, all except Barber, said that they were terribly interested in the idea of a device that would help them with this serious problem. Barber said he didn't have that problem, and if you listen to his music, it's clear that he was telling the truth. <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying that critically at all. I love Barber's music. I think it's terrific. Uh, he clearly doesn't have the problem. On the other hand, there are many people who clearly do. Um, okay, well, in addition to the, in addition to the uh, composer's problem, music publishers obviously have a terrible problem. Most pieces of music are, are carved in stone and uh, then printed. And if you look at a lot of classical texts, you can see that they've been carved in stone for a long time. There are a lot of mistakes in there, and they haven't gotten corrected for the simple reason that stone carving is hard. And uh, so, uh, so if we could page, most of the pages of music that are prepared today are still drawn by hand and then photo offset. So uh, the whole business of page preparation in music is still uh, in the Stone Age, although there are now people, of course, who have built computer systems to, uh, to do it. But a large majority of the music that is produced is still done in, by very primitive methods. And uh, so music publishers and the people that go in front of music publishers are obviously interested in this kind of, kind of bracket as well. As far as computer science is concerned, there are a number of, uh, number of explanations why one might, uh, might be interested in it. First of all, what we've built here is an editor, and it's a smart editor that has some knowledge about the objects that are being edited. It takes advantage of that, that knowledge in helping you to do the editing. Uh, and editors seem to be a thing that are of interest here at Park. Uh, another thing is that this particular editor uh, presents a rather a rather complex and difficult user interface because the amount of knowledge that you have about the sort of raw material that you're trying to lay in is vast. And so since you need to be able to say lots of different kinds of things about it, being able to say those in a simple, uh, uh, easy fashion is uh, fig figuring out ways to make it, make it simple to say those things is not easy. So the user interface is a hard thing, and we all know that user interfaces are something we're interested in. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess the last thing to say is this. I have a general feeling that uh, the kinds of things that we're doing might be classed, or some of the things we're trying to do might be classed as AI. They would certainly be classed as AI if we tried to build programs to do most of the things. But in fact, what we have done is to uh, follow a philosophy that says, uh, don't try to figure out how to do those hard things. Rather, give the user a set of, set of actions that he can take whereby he can lay in the structure that you're looking for. There's a lot of pattern recognition that goes on in music. And so rather than trying to solve all those really hard problems, uh, one can, one, we might have chosen to focus on trying to solve those hard problems for a limited number of cases. People have done that in the past. I was, on the other hand, concerned with building a real tool. And if all you can, all you can end up in, in recognizing is some terribly simple Baroque music, uh, that's not of much interest to a modern composer. So I wanted to build a tool which was a, which was a real tool, and we're fairly far along. Uh, I should say, by the way, that what you're going to see is a, uh, a system that is by no means finished. Uh, we've got quite a lot done uh, in the short time that we've had, but uh, it's by no means finished. Now, here's some things that uh, this, this whole road is littered with the bodies of people who have gotten distracted uh, <laughs> one way or another. Music is a, is a wonderful thing. It's just as, as diverse as you want to make it. And there are lots of things that people have tried to do. And, and here are a couple, for example, of things that people have tried to do that we're just not doing at all. OK, this is uh, one is inventing a better music notation. Now, you'll see different ways of representing music uh, as we show you the, uh, the demonstration. But all those are directed at, aimed, aimed at getting eventually to a standard score that anybody who reads normal music could read. A lot of people are interested in trying to invent notational systems that are more flexible and more this and more that than the current standard sort of regular vanilla music notation. We're not into that. We're really trying to aim at people's music, which can be written down in more or less regular routine notation. Modern notation a little bit, but not really wildly so. Kind of thing you pick up if you go and buy a, buy a piece of music at the store. Um, and we're not interested in computer generation that, of, of music. That's a whole other bag, and we're just not, we're not playing with that. OK, now there are also a set of things which we're not presently doing, 
but we might, might consider that, that are somewhat closer to the domain of things that we are interested in. One is turning the end product of this thing into something that you might really consider seriously publishing. Right now, we're only aiming at a quality of score that is something that a regular musician could read, but it isn't, doesn't follow all the fine demands of a music publisher. We're not, not trying to do that. Various people have tried to do that, and that's a hard, hard job. And we're not, we simply have not tried to do that. And so you mustn't criticize, you mustn't look at our stuff and say you're a little bit off here, you're a little bit off there. We've not tried to do that. We've tried to make it good enough so that any reasonable musician could expect to read the thing. But that's all. Uh, we're also not, uh, and this is a thing that everybody seems to be, be confused about, we're also not into the business of trying to make uh, interesting, nice, uh, pleasant sounds. What you... What we use here for a sound producing thing is a standard synthesizer. It's a keyboard that we use for input, and the synthesizer is making all the sound of the output. And it's got little knobs on it that you can turn, but that's the only variation that we can make in the sound. We're, we're using this sound output at the moment only as a proofreading mechanism for the, for the composer. You'll see, it, you'll see it used in that way. But it's, it's not supposed to really sound nice, OK? You mustn't, our, our object is not to try to make nice sounding music. Our object is to try to make a score which is readable. We use the, we use the sound primarily as a, as a medium whereby you can listen to approximately to what you've, you've written down. Uh, and finally, we're, we've not done any work uh, to worry about the quality of the performance. Is it, is it slow down at the right time, speed up? It doesn't do any of those things at the moment. The moment it plays through at a regular pace, and, uh, and, and it sounds quite mechanical in its performance. Again, that has to do with not, trying, not being interested at the moment in the quality of the, of the music that you hear. We're aimed uh, hard at the score. OK, well now, why do you build an editor? Why don't you just solve the problem? Build something you can play into, and it plays back the music. There are, there are a lot of, it's, it's hard is the answer, of course. And there are a lot of, a lot of things that people think at first uh, you push a note down, well, you've got to learn which note that has been pushed down. That's easy. We can figure that out. Now you've got to figure out, is it a quarter note or an eighth note? Well, it's pretty easy. You know, you find out how long the guy held it down. Not so. Here's, here's Mary Had a Little Lamb in a number of different ways. Now here the fellow played it what you call legato. That's where you hold the note down until you get ready to hit the next note approximately. Uh, here's where he played the same thing staccato. That is, he, he let the, hit the notes da, 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 and so forth, it, in a, it, letting them go in a big hurry. Same music, the only difference would be a little mark over each note that says that you're supposed to let it go in a hurry. But as far as, the, as, far as this representation is concerned, it would look exactly the same. But, you know, here you are. You're the poor computer, and you're looking at these two things, and you're told they're the same. So the duration of the note really doesn't have anything to do with uh, its logical time value. Now, what in fact does have to do with is the distance from this note to that note, from the first one to the second one. That gives you some clue about the time of the first note. On the other hand, the guy speeds up and slows down as he plays, so that's a problem. But you might think that once you've solved that, that you can then figure out you know, what the time values of notes are. Well, just in case you think that, there you go. Now, that's a little more realistic example, you see. Trouble with it is, is there are a whole bunch of notes going. And you probably were not able to guess that what that looks like is this, when you get it all done. And the reason that you weren't is that there's a lot of structure in there that says what goes with what. And that's the thing that we're going to be talking about. You have, to, you have to understand what goes with what before you can draw music. And if you're just faced with the raw information of a mess of notes all thrown into a bucket in a time sequence, that's not enough. There's a lot more information. It's, just, it's very much similar to the problem of speech recognition. A lot of same kinds of things go on. Now, I want to just give you a quick picture of what, the way we think about music, OK? Music consists of a bunch of measures, and in, in the standard notation, time is divided up along a regular ruler here. There's a real ruler that, that you think of as extending through music. The nature of the ruler depends a little bit on what we call a time signature here. But there is the notion of a quarter. And by God, every quarter and every measure during a certain section is supposed to be the same modulo the, the whimsy of the performer. But I mean, in absolute terms, it's really supposed to be the same. Furthermore, there's not only this, not only the structure that way, but there's a vertical structure. There are what we're calling voices, and I'm, I'm sorry that I'm using that term. I don't, there is no good term for what I want to say. I'll show you why in a minute. A voice here is a pile of stuff that forms a consistent linear picture through the music. It's a pile of, a pile of notes, and there may be more than one note going on at a given time, but if there are, those notes in a particular voice form themselves into a chord. And you'll notice here that 
the pieces, the elements that you build these, uh, these voices out of are these various kinds of notes. They're half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes. It starts to sound a little binary in nature, and indeed it is, although there are ways of violating that so you can get ninth notes and stuff like that. There are methods for that. Furthermore, you notice that the voices don't always extend all the way through the measures. Voices come and go in the thing, and you hear them happening all the time. But that's sort of the basic structure that we have. And I want to show you a quick example. I can see that this is going to last longer than I thought. Uh, I need a pointer. <coughs> Anybody got it? Focus, please, your attention on this measure right here. And in fact, you can see that there are really three things going on as we go by that measure. One of them is represented by this line down here in the left hand. And that's all tied together by this sort of long beam. This is a beam that goes across the bottom. These things, vertical things, are stemmed. These are beams on the bottom. Notice, in fact, what's happening is that there are, th there are four sets of things. Well, this is a piece in 2-4 time. That means that there's supposed to be two quarters here. And each one of these things is, uh, takes up, uh, each one of these sets of three takes up what's called an eighth. So you end up adding up to two quarters. And the fact that there are three little guys here is a, a complexity because, uh, well, it's, it's indicated back here in this measure. There's no clue in here that what's going on, but you've had a clue given back here. And, and uh, you, as a musician, know clearly that this, thing, this pattern carries through, except over here, of course, there are two, and any fool can see that that's the, that's the right thing. <laughs> so, uh, so the computer's supposed to not be a fool about this. Now, the other thing that's going on up here, which you're not supposed to be confused by, and which, in fact, conflicts with all this down here, is the fact that there are two things up here. One of them is, and they're separated because one's got its stem going up and the other's got its stem going down, so you and I can see that. Now, the computer just sees notes, no stems. So, uh, so it, it gets an appalling view of this. It just sees a pile of notes here, and it really doesn't know what to do. And, uh, and when we looked at it, we didn't know what to do. Uh, except listen to it, and as soon as you listen to it, you can hear exactly what it is you want. Now, the guy who wrote this, happens to be dad, my dad, he knew what he wanted, and, uh, and so he drew this in in this way so that the next person to come along trying to read this thing could tell what it was that was supposed to go on there. And then as you listen to this thing, you can say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. We'll play this for you a little later, and then you can sort of see. Okay. I hope you're all prepared to last here a little bit beyond five. Uh, what you're going to see is a system that is presently in design. Um, the one person who's been working on this thing full time is John. This is his master's thesis. He's a student from MIT. And, uh, and he's accomplished just, uh, I think, an incredible amount in the last five months. And uh, the others, there are others of us who have offered consolation, advice, uh, various pieces of wisdom. And, uh, uh, but John is the only guy who's, uh, who's raised pencil to paper to do anything about this until this afternoon. So he gets all the credit for the, uh, for the work of this program. Now, uh, be prepared that, that this, is, this is not a completely final system. And as I say, we got a lot of things back here, any one of which could uh, cause things uh, to go bad. This line down here says, already people have been coming around saying, gee, I, I sure wouldn't mind being the guy to start using your system. It's not ready. Uh, I'm about to leave for a couple of months. and. John is about to launch into thesis writing mode, and we are not going to allow any, uh, any users of the system at this stage of the game. It's really not ready yet. It's still somewhat fragile, and no a number of things that would make it a complete system are missing. We expect, as we'll tell you in a little bit, to go on with it and, and work it through, and eventually you will be able to. But for the next couple of months, please don't ask. OK, quickly, here's, the, here's our pile of stuff. And my gosh, these guys got twice as much stuff as we've got. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here's John. Here's the keyboard. <laughs> the keyboard and the sound producing boxes, these two boxes, uh, come in a package and you pay $1,500 and Yamaha gives it to you. <laughs> then, then you go get a Dorado. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you design one of these little red things here and one of those there. This is a board that goes inside the Dorado and speaks Doradoese. Uh, this is, a, uh, this is a board that speaks to each and every note out here in the keyboard and passes the news uh, when, when notes get hit into the Dorado. And, uh, and you can pass information through that box also. It plays the, the uh, there's logic in the thing that makes a sound for each note. And you can either play through this, directly through this thing in sort of the way that Yamaha thought of it. Or you can send the news off to the Dorado and the Dorado can send it back. Or the Dorado can even send things that you never said back. And, uh, so that's roughly it. And then on the far side, of course, is amplifiers and speakers. And you can hear the speakers clicking away here, because I don't know why we've got some terrible crosstalk problem. That is the system. And now I'm going to turn it over to John.
Go ahead, go ahead, John. I had to talk a little bit about the system. First of all, it's written in Mesa. Um, it's about 5,000 lines of code. That's about 100 pages if you print it. Uh, it takes about two minutes to compile the whole system on the Dorado, to give you an idea of the size. Um, give you a, first of all, I want, before I give you a demonstration, I'd like you to give you a, a little explanation about the data structure underneath it. Okay. Because it's not quite what you'd think it'd be. When we first started out designing a system, uh, when we designed the, the logical data structure, uh, which I'll explain that term in just a second, uh, we thought of it as a hierarchical system. That is, you have a score which consists of a series of sections, each of which consists of a bunch of measures which have notes and, and beams and notes and chords and so on down the line. Uh, after thinking about it and trying to design some of the algorithms we were going to use, we decided that wasn't really uh, quite what we wanted. Um, the reason is there are three musical domains in which we're w are, that we're working in. And we call the physical domain, the logical domain, the graphical domain. If I give you a, a metaphor, an analogy between music and speech, you can see the difference, differences. First uh, mus musical domain is uh, the physical, which is something like a piano roll, where you have real-time plotted versus pitch. <laughs> And this would be something like a speech waveform. And there's very little information attached other than uh, the actual notes and when they were struck. The next is the logical, which is sort of the semantics of music. It has to do with quarter notes, pitches, voices, beams, chords, etc. And that, that's like the concepts that you have in your mind when you speak. And the last is the graphical. And that has to do more with the placement of notes on the sheet of paper, the tilt of beams, and whether the stems are up and down. And that's document preparation. So far, we've only been in, uh, really working on the physical and logical. Eventually, we hope to go to graphical. But we wanted a data structure that, would, um, that, it, that was flexible enough to cover all these domains, and also that was forgiving enough to handle inconsistent data. And the fact that we have an editor means that it's not likely to be right the first time. The guy's going to want to change it. Okay. We found that after thinking about it a long time, uh, that there were two invariants that held across all three of these domains. The first was the concept of an event. Do you want to show the slide up? Concept of an event, which is a series of uh, notes or something like that that all occur at the same time, where time can be defined either in seconds or in beats or in inches on the page, corresponding to physical, logical, and graphical. Okay? And usually these things that were simultaneously played were simultaneous on the score and were simultaneous in, in the um, vertical dimension on the, p the piece of paper. The other concept, these are very simple now that we figured them out, but the, the other concept was that of ordering of these events and that the order of the events was maintained in all three domains. Things that were played before one another in the physical domain were before one another in logical were placed before one another in the graphical domain. Okay, And the beams and chords were auxiliary data structures you want to, um, that sort of pointed into um, the, the data structure. And so you can see up here we have a score, which consists of a series of events, each of which has a time and a bunch of notes. And the beams or chords point into the score and hang off the edge and aren't that important to what we're doing. Um, beams and chords are sort of like parentheses on, if you, if you give me the first slide again, just for a second. Yeah. Beams and chords are parentheses on the music. You can see that they group things either horizontally or vertically. But they're not that important to how it sounds, for instance, and just the interpretation, the semantics. Okay. Um, we have a model of music that is logical. We have logical data structure, which I've just described. We also have, and that, that model is a, a one long ordered string of events. We also have a view of that data structure that appears remarkably like a standard musical score, as you'll see. But it's, it's just a view, and that view can be modified. Okay, and now I'm going to go uh, give a demonstration. A uh, sheet of paper, which is an aspect of the view. Uh, this is a sheet of musical paper. One, one part of the aspect of the view is the staffing system. You see here we have uh, bass and treble uh, clefs on a two-staff system. We can also look at three-staff system here with a duplicated treble, um, duplicated bass, both of them duplicated if you, choose, if you have a lot going on at the same time. And finally, something we found useful is a four-staff system where the top staff is two octaves above um, the treble, or, yeah, the treble, and the bottom staff is two octaves below the bass. Uh, this particular one has the advantage that it covers the entire range of the keyboard, like that. <laughs> so that there's no overlap at all between the, the two, or uh, between this, this set of staffs and this one down here. Don't have to worry about fixing that. OK, um, as you just saw, we can enter music directly from the keyboard. 
what I'm doing now when I did this is a, a selection, where I'm saying I would select from this time here over to this time here. I can go down the line as well, as you see. And when I say record, what I'm asking to do is do a cut and paste, that it cuts out this black selected thing and, and pastes in whatever I play from the piano keyboard. You can also do standard cuts and paste on the, the sheet of paper. Right now we're going to do it. I can insert notes. There we go. There are, two way, there are two types of editing that you'd like to do on a piano roll. One is to change the notes, either insert, as I just did, or delete, and, the, um, and also move them around. I can just pick this note up and, if I want and slide it up and down, <laughs> slide it to the left, left and right <laughs> until I get it in the position I want. Or um, that's the first type, just to, to manipulate the notes. The second type, if I now play this, it'll sound right. So you see. So I, the changes are immediately reflected when I play. The second type is to do cut and paste on the, the piano roll itself. Now you might wonder how you might do anything interesting in cut and paste with so little of the music on the screen. Well, we have an answer for that. We have an overview that shows everything scaled by four. And it's a wonder of Cedar Graphics here that this was so easy to do. And I can do cut and paste on this. I can decide that I want to replace that section with that section. I have an alternative selection. And you can see it's uh, duplicated there. I can you know, delete. What the use of this piano roll notation is, is that um, it's sort of like a, a visible tape recorder in that the musician can play snatches of pieces and overlay voices as well. We have that capability. Play against himself until he produces a score that sounds like he wants. Has advantage over tape recorder that it's easy for him to scan for things, find things. He can tell by the shapes here uh, where he, are, his, he is in the section and, and pay, cut and paste something together that sounds like he wants to produce. Un unfortunately, uh, although this is really sort of fun to play with, it's, it's not very useful for a real musician. And uh, I'll give you an example of why. You want to do the A-flat a lot? <laughs> all right, and that's what he played. I'm sure you all recognize it. <laughs> um, I can play this back, and if you if you notice also, there's a cursor follows as we play along the bottom. you never guess that that was in fact that. <laughs> Modulo the interpretation. <laughs> um, let's see. So we want something that looks more like this, that's logical music. And so the interesting question is how can we convert from that piano roll, which you just saw, into the standard logical stuff? And so I'm going I'm to start with a very simple piece and just go, go through the motions. Let me get an empty screen. Uh, use a piano roll. Let's see if I don't break anything. Oh, from Malaguena. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. Um, the first thing I want to do is I'm looking at the piano roll notation, and uh, it's not very useful. So I'm going to start going in the process of changing the view of the underlying model so that it looks more and more like what I want. The first thing I do to change the view is just get rid of those bars. And I now have little X's to indicate that I don't know what the time values are. And I talked about um, events as being simultaneous things. Uh, that's important, and uh, the, the system knows something about events. And so it has uh, little lines that it draws up and down to show what it thinks are the simultaneous events. Now, there are a couple of problems here. You notice this 
I don't know if you can see what I'm pointing at. The last thing I played, I played it slightly out of sync because I, I wasn't that good. And uh, so the first thing I'd like to be able to do is just manually go in and say I want that all to be a simultaneous event, move stuff over. There's a second mistake here. The computer will use a slightly wider window and run through itself and uh, sync all things up with, that it thinks within a certain tolerance uh, should be logical events as opposed to physical events. Um, having played this in and made it simultaneous, I can now play it back and beat in measures. This is very useful as a, an aid to the editor uh, or the person, the user, to find out where he is in the piece. It's also useful for the computer, as we'll see in a section, second. So now I have measure lines. If I put a time signature in this, you see there, um, that'll be useful to the computer for a sec and in a little bit because it'll be able to add up uh, the, the various voices in the measures to make sure that they um, are correct. You see, the next thing that's important is uh, Severo talked a little bit about the different voices in uh, a piece. Well, that's something the computer could, could never figure out. So the, uh, the user has to, well, let's see, first thing I'll do is get rid of the sinks. Um, the user has to specify manually what are to be the different voices. I don't know if you can tell, but when I select a note, it turns it gray. There are two types of selection. There's a uh, note selection and area selection. Okay, and I can specify all those are to be in voice one. Now I can, having done that, I can change my view so it only looks at voice one. And any editing actions I do will only affect this voice. Makes it uh, extremely easy to, uh, to separate out the complexities of the interaction between the voices to edit. Now, I happen to know this piece well. It's, uh, our, I'm now specifying time values. If these are whole notes here, whole notes here. Uh, now I can do an area selection and specify that those are both half notes. Uh, those are, happen to be chorded. If I wanted, I could do an area selection and say, uh, chord all things in the same voice on the same uh, event. And these last things here are whole notes as well. I'm going I'm to make a purposeful mistake here to demonstrate something. That is, uh, I'll make these all whole notes like that. Now, if I, I, the computer should be able to tell, if it were smart, that there's something wrong here, because there are two whole notes in, in this measure when, in 404 time. In fact, the computer is smart. You see, it just grayed that for me when I asked it to check to say that there was something wrong with this particular voice. I take that off. Make those half and chord. So now we can look at the other voice as well. This is fairly simple. It's uh, mostly <coughs> quarters, all corded. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. Except that these are actually halves here. If I ask the computer to check this for me, it complains about this, obviously, because that should be whole. And it complained about the first one. Uh, in this piece, I happen to know that the, this voice, what I'm doing now is I'm going to a menu to select something I want to insert, which is a a half rest. <coughs> this voice actually has a half rest in the front of it. It goes right there. And now it no longer complains. Uh, we now look at both voices. Now th this is uh, getting closer to the, the concept we have of a, a graphical stuff, but it's still short of a couple of things. Uh, the first is that it's, its placement is linear with time. In other words, if I played this whole note and I played 128th notes over here, you'd have 128th notes between here and here. 128 of them, and you'd be impossible to read. And when, in fact, music is more logarithmic in placement across the sheet. Um, the second thing is that the measure lines don't really match up on the edge. Um, that, that's sort of a, a nice aesthetics thing, but managed to handle that as well. So I asked the, the computer to do a justification, of justify, and it, and it handles all those things for me as well. One other aspect I can change of the view is I can specify a key for the sheet that it's coming through. So if I say everything is a key of C sharp, specify seven sharps. <laughs> um, also, now that I'm no longer working with piano roll, I'd like to work on the two-staff system. Uh, that was easy to change the view. So we now have something that looks pretty much like music. If I play it back, it's going to play it back from this score rather than from the, the piano roll. There's an error in there, but I'm not going to chase it down. <laughs> um, that, that's one other advantage that we'll specify uh, later, is that since you can play it back, you can hear errors 
and you can correct them. And it's a wonderful tool because for that sort of thing. We, we imagine if Bravo could read out the text to you. <laughs> okay, um, we've seen one way of in, our, seen one way of inserting uh, notes. That's from the piano uh, that we have here. Another for those of you who aren't quite the piano virtuosos that I am, uh, you might want to insert notes manually, and we have. Uh, uh, means for doing that, as you saw earlier. That is to select a note and insert it. Now you notice that as I slide this note, I can move it back and forth this way. So as I slide the note up and down, it very carefully specifies the proper accidental for this key, which is, and since it's seven sharps, the only accidental is a natural. <laughs> um, I can, oh, we'll change the key in just a second. Um, now notice that when I put the second one down, it's noticed that there's a, oops, shouldn't have done that. Let's move this one down. I move notes that are already there. Notice that when I when I specify this to be a natural, it reasserted the sharpness of this note to, you know, for the proper key. And then if I now put this here, it has the natural again. And reassert the sharp there, back and forth. Well, we'll put all those in voice zero. Let's do something really strange and uh, put two whole notes here. And uh, I'll specify that those are simultaneous events because I, some, for some reason, when I played them in, I put them in that way. Put a measure line. Now, if we we're also put these in a different voice, voice one. If we look at voice zero, system, our, I'm doing a check now. The system doesn't complain about that because it's four quarter notes and four four time. If we look at voice one, again, the system doesn't complain because two half notes and four four time. If we look at them both, though, the system's smart enough to do the interaction between the voices and complain about that measure because this adds up as a quarter plus a quarter plus we get here and here's a quarter and a half so it adds up to a half that's four four time right there plus there's another half here that makes up six four times just not possible now um, there was something interesting that you didn't notice about look justify earlier and that was it corrects these types of mistakes when you have voices that fill measures that automatically does a uh, alignment of, of, of voices so if I do look justify Watch these two half notes carefully, and you'll see them move to the proper position, which is at the beginning and then over here. You can play this. I don't know what it sounds like. Horrible. OK. So you can see, Look Justified is a very powerful sort of thing. Uh, it's just a manipulation of the view, in a sense. All right. Uh, we're going to pull something in. Uh, these are all very simple examples. Uh, Boys show that we can, in fact, do things that are a little more complex. Oh, uh, that's right. This may die. I pulled in the wrong file. You have to wait a second. Hopefully you all will recognize this as we play the first few bars. So the Moon Knight Sonata. Now uh, show that we can do more things than just notes and chords. You see some things here that are they are fairly complex. First of all, there are a number of voices going on. A fairly simple voice here, followed with by a bass. A small voice that runs along the top. Uh, there are beam stuff. I can take these beams and move them up and down. I can uh, tilt the beams if I wish. It's an editable uh, view, so one way of thinking about it. Um, if I look at voice zero, I don't like the way I did this one beam right here. So I'm going to show you how, how you would specify a beam. First thing is take this beam out. I select those three notes. I don't know if you can tell, but they've been grayed. And just say beam, beam. Now I can. Um, this is all right now, except that uh, these should be end tuplets rather than just beamed. So what I can do is I can select those notes and specify that that's a uh, triplet. Or I can area select all those beams and specify that those are all triplets. So it's, it's fairly quick on those sorts of things. Um, one advantage you have, we saw earlier, is that you hear mistakes. And so what we're going to do, and we can also speed this up. It's a computer. It does uh, all sorts of wonderful tricks like that. So uh, I don't, you may not be able to recognize it this beat, but, but uh, if you look at all voices, I don't know if you can, t you'll be able to 
see, I'm going to try to have it so you can follow the cursor and we'll scroll up. This scrolls up and down. Um, see if you can see a cursor moving along the middle here as it plays each note. If you heard it, but I thought I heard a mistake there. <laughs> um, now the musician, we played it very fast. The musician might not have caught exactly where it is. So what we can do is we can do a small uh, section and just play that. <laughs> Definitely a mistake. <laughs> and having narrowed down the field, we can e even do better by slowing it down very slow. <laughs> Finding the error. <laughs> this is uh, this note shouldn't be here, spurious, and this note should come down to there. And now, if we play, it should sound right. One other feature. See, one other feature is that um, the music process is completely independent of the editing process. So while it's playing. You can do editing feature things. <laughs> you can even change the notes. You can even change the notes while it's playing. It takes a little while to reflect it, but it's there. Uh, this has, uh, part of the reason I brought this uh, Moonlight sonata up is because it has some interesting voicing characteristics. Uh, there's got other things as well. If you didn't see, I don't know if you can see it down here, but there's a, a triplet without a beam. It knows about those sorts of things, where it's beamed to rest and two eighth notes together as a triplet. Um, also up here, I, I hope you can see this, but several of these notes are shared in different voices, particularly this note right here, this note right here, and this note right here. You might wonder why the musician had that in mind. Well, there must have been a reason. We don't know, but the editor's got to be able to handle that. But if we look at the different voices, we can see a little bit. Let me play this up. Listen for those three notes. I'll speed it up a bit. Got some Shouldn't make any difference. Okay. If we look at voice zero, play that. If you listen to those particular notes, they're they're in this voice, but they're only played short. is very short. There is another voice that contains those notes as part of the melodic line for some reason. Beethoven chose to do that. And looking at all the voices, if you listen carefully now, you should be able to hear um, both that, those notes as being in both voices at the same time. By the duration is something of interest. Um, to, this is fairly complex, but we can get even more complex than that by doing some of Severo's father's work. <laughs> this is not a <laughs> Notice this has uh, seven tuplets. Actually, it's seven notes in the time of four. That's right up here. You can see the little sevens there. And so we can handle things more complex than just triplets. Um, it has a funny beating pattern going along the top, again, beating against this this lower voice. Actually, we can show you uh, a little bit of that. Let me play this for you. We found this to be an interesting or useful teaching tool, as well as being wonderful for composers. Actually, it's not very useful as a teaching tool for composers, because generally they already know their music. But uh, for us, there, there are a couple of advantages. Um, first of all, since the cursor tracks the music, you begin to associate what's on the screen with what's being played. And the second is we can look at the separate voices and hear them played uh, by themselves. For instance, this particular piece has a, a top line running like this. I 
right, now hold that in your mind while we, li while we listen to this voice. Now, if you remember both of those at the same time, while you're listening to the whole thing, you'll actually be able to pick them out better than you had before, unless you were an accomplished musician. Just something of interest on the side. Uh, another thing we like to point out with this, I'm going to play it once more through. And at the bottom of this, you'll find that there are some strange notes. The, that's the original piano roll. And uh, when, it, when the cursor gets to this piece right here, you'll suddenly hear how the piece was originally played in. And this particular section is, is uh, completely representative of the whole piece and show you what you had to work with in order to get this. <laughs> got, you might think we're finished, but uh, <laughs> we're not. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll clamp your shirt and you do that. I can't drive these things. Uh, these are the things that are missing at the moment. Uh, grace notes, those are those little things at the front. We can fake those, so we have it by putting in 32nd notes or 64th notes and lying about the number of them and so on. Uh, trills, you can obviously put in with lots of little notes. Uh, adjacent note fix-up, that is the fact that, in, in fact, in real music, uh, if you have two notes that are supposed to be directly uh, one on a line and one in the space above it, you're supposed to ooch them apart horizontally a little bit uh, so, that, so that somebody can tell they're there. We don't do that, you might have noticed. Uh, but that's a simple thing to add. Most of these things are simple things to add. Uh, we had a, mo a function for a while that let you beamed, be beam beamed sets together so that you could get, uh, but that's gone away somewhere. Uh, we'll get it back. Uh, we don't have any ties and slurs at the moment, but uh, those, are, those are relatively straightforward to add. As I say, most of these things are relatively easy to add once you've got what John's got already. Uh, this midstream clef switching is not quite the thing I showed you on the earlier slide, but it rather it's the fact that every now and then uh, because the left hand is supposed to be playing something up high, you rename this clef that the left hand is playing, you call it treble. Uh, there's also uh, this thing called octava notation, which uh, lets you say, I'm really, I'm really uh, telling you that it's an octave above where it looks as though it is, or an octave below. Uh, there is, uh, there, we have at the moment only one tempo for the whole piece. We, uh, we have at the moment only one staffing a method for the whole piece. If you say you want it to show a treble and two bass staffs, that's what it shows through the whole piece, and clearly you have to have that on a sectional basis. For those of you who know much about music, we don't handle rolled chords. If you roll a chord, it's going to show all as though it were played at the same time. Uh, and then there are all these special markings for, uh, for tempo and so forth that uh, we will put in, and whether we will attach real meaning to those, interpretive meaning as far as the playing is concerned is a, a, a moot point. Uh, automatic beaming is uh, a, a thing that, that, in fact, the program should be able to handle and will. Uh, this whole notion of look same, which says, I want this to look sort of like that. Music has a lot of that in it, and clearly we need some function like that. We don't at the moment have any ability to get hard copy, and that's one of the first things, of course, that we'd add to this. Uh, that, that will drop out. A lot of this will drop. Some of these things will drop out uh, relatively uh, simply when we move on to Mesa 6. We don't have multiple windows at the moment. All that cutting and pasting is with one window, and it's, we don't have very good scrolling. Uh, all those things uh, you know, are, are primitive at the moment, and, but we know how to fix most of those things. Uh, also, we can only handle a relatively modest size piece, pretty good size piece, actually. But it, those of you who were, who were here earlier heard <laughs> a piece, and there appeared to be breaks in the thing. Those weren't breaks in the tape. Those were breaks because the memory had gotten full, and we had to then start over, and we patched it on the tape. Uh, but there, uh, obviously, uh, it, that's a simple matter because this, this is just living in the core that's in this Dorado at the moment. And uh, in fact, it's not even using all the core. It's living in alto space. It's living in a, a, a small fraction of that. When we use long pointers, we'll be able to use all the core that's in there. But obviously, the right fix to that is a virtual memory. And as we all know, that's coming. Uh, uh, 
there's a whole set of issues about uh, the, the prettiness of the graphical, uh, uh, the graphical presentation. You may want to make changes in the appearance of what you see, which are only in the appearance. They don't, don't affect the underlying model of the thing at all. And we don't have any capability for doing that right now. When John changes the appearance here, he's really changing the appearance. In a, it's a view of the logical representation that he was talking about that is actually being changed. We actually have some view things. You can make the stems go up or down. Those are really view items. But uh, for the most part, they're, they're really the, the, we don't have any real, those are hacks at the moment. There, there's no real method for adjusting the looks of the thing without changing some fairly fundamental piece of uh, uh, structure. Also, of course, we need an undo, as we've found on a number of occasions. Uh, and uh, John, furthermore, wants to experiment with guessing the time values. I said that's hard. Once you've done the parsing into voices, it's sort of like presenting someone with the problem of speech understanding. Once you've parsed it into words, it's a lot easier, right? Uh, and uh, so, so, we have the, uh, so we have sort of the same thing. Once you've split it up into voices and put measure lines in, then it becomes a little more reasonable to start guessing as to what the time values are. Is there a rest there, or is there, is there, is there really a note being held, and so forth? Uh, by the way, this issue of spelling, uh, at the moment, you, you didn't see that, but at the moment, John has a very, uh, very primitive uh, method of spelling uh, notes within a scale. There are lots of fancy rules for it. Whether you show a black note as a C sharp or a D flat depends on a lot of things. And at the moment, he's got a fairly simplistic set of rules, which are not the rules that any musician would understand at all. Uh, we'd ha we'll have to build those in eventually. But uh, again, this is good enough when you think about it as a, as a proofreader. Uh, we don't have any means for, for uh, even correcting the spelling at the moment. If you look at the thing and you say, I don't like it as a C sharp, I want it to be a D flat, you can't fix it at the moment. And that we have to have, here's a, uh, what I'm talking about, that's up here, uh, or that's somewhere here, yeah. Uh, spelling, hand graphical, would be changing the spelling. Doesn't change the value of the note at all, just changes the way you think of it. But uh, we could also build in a set of rules that know about all these rules of harmony which guide the, the uh, whether it's a C-sharp or a D-flat, and have an automatic spelling corrector uh, in the thing. That, uh, again, that's, that, that's a little bit harder for us to do. So we're not planning immediately to do any of those things. Um, okay, well, over the course of the spring, uh, we hope to finish up the uh, some of these things. John, over the next couple of months, is going to be writing his thesis, but when he gets done, he's going to go back and start working on that list of things there. Uh, and then over the spring, we expect to haul some of these guys in here that I talked to. Uh, Bernstein said he wanted to come and uh, play with the thing when we got it done, so we're going to haul him in here if he'll call and, uh, and uh, see whether they believe that we've, we've got anywhere with it. It's, it requires a bit of work before it's ready for that, obviously. Uh, We've thought that music schools might be interested in this as a teaching, uh, teaching thing. Uh, this, is, this is assuming that we're in the world. We're full of Dorados now. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, we're going to talk to the folks at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, we're going to talk to the Yamaha people. I've heard a rumor that Yamaha is trying to build a, an electronic instrument to compete with real, honest-to-God, grand pianos, real good stuff. Okay, I, I don't know what it's going to cost. It's obvious that in the long run, that's a wonderful thing for them to do. Because those of you who have little spinets in your home because you haven't got room for or, uh, or can't afford uh, that $40,000 Busendorfer uh, wouldn't mind having something that's on a chip that you could plug into your hi-fi set. And <laughs> so, so Yamaha has a substantial interest in this. I, I don't know. I have to have a Yamaha. I found out when I bought it that Yamaha makes more pianos now than all the other piano manufacturers in the world put together, combined. So they're also into pianos. Uh, and they make very fine pianos, too. It should be noted that it can run on other machines. This is a Mesa program, and uh, it runs on almost any machine that uh, has a Mesa program. The, the hardware that's in here is very modest. You can see it sticking out there, and there's one board in the Dorado. It can be done for another machine. The real-time playing is not a hard problem. The reason that you need the speed of the machine is for this editor, just like any other editor. Keeping that graphic view up to date is what's hard. That's what uses the, the bean power of the Dorado. Uh, and if it weren't for the Dorado, this clearly would, would really be impractical, I think, at the moment. Uh, and furthermore, I uh, should say that John has laid, leaned heavily on the shoulders of lots and lots of people. The Mesa world is underneath all this. The Cedar Graphics is a vital part of this. This is built on Cedar Graphics and was a sort of a fine first real use of the Cedar Graphics package. We hope that's going to get faster. John Warnock and, uh, and Doug Wyatt deserve a lot of credit for that. And we would not have this at this point if it hadn't been for those folks. Uh, Let's see, other people who need to be acknowledged here. Will Crowther helped just enormously with this. He worked with, uh, uh, with John 
uh, last year and taught him a lot about how to approach such problems in a sort of a brute force way. And I think that that was extremely helpful. And furthermore, Will has helped and consulted with how to approach this problem. And I've talked to Will about this over the years as we've contemplated doing this. Gene McDaniel uh, wrote the microcode that actually drives uh, and listens to the keyboard. Uh, Doug Wyatt built the fonts that you see and is working on some fonts for a hard copy. Uh, Mike Overton actually, uh, and my friend there, wired all uh, the stuff up. And you know, you do a simple thing for each key, but there, there are actually 76 of them on this machine. So there are lots of wires that had to go in and lots of little cuts and places that each key had to be doctored just a little bit. We had to find out about the inside of the uh, Yamaha. Ed McCrite helped figure out what they had done. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Uh, and last but not least, we have an actual resident composer. And I want to play you now a piece that was written by Chris Jeffers last night <laughs> for this instrument. Take it away. to answer any questions you have. <laughs> How long did it take to edit this? Pardon? How long did Chris take to edit that? With or without the problems with the editor. <laughs> <laughs> About 30 minutes of page. This is a little more complex because he did several overlaying voices. It has four or five voices in it. You might be interested to know that that was built by Chris first putting in one chunk of it, and then we fixed that up, put it away, and then we played it. And while we were playing it, Chris played more stuff in on top of it. And then we, and we were able to separate that out because we knew what he'd played in is different from the stuff that was there. Then he fixed that up, we combined them, put it away, played that, and so on. And that's how we build up to so many different kinds of things going on at once. It really is. Let's see, uh, what do you call it? Caprice for 7.4 hands. Well, <laughs> there are about seven things going on in there. I don't know whether you, you, you can, uh, we can play it for you again later if you want, but there's a lot going on at the end. <laughs> There's no way that seven hands were going to play it. Yes? Uh, 30 minutes of page for this. What about people no, no. You know, in the profession who do it now for something like that? How long would it take to transcribe? Uh, this would, this, I don't know what this would be. It's hard to say. You wouldn't get all that stuff on a single page. I mean, you'd have about six staffs going. Music does sometimes, uh, even uh, simple piano music, sometimes to separate out the voices and the things that are going on, does sometimes extend to many staffs. Not just the standard two. You very, if you look at real complicated music, you'll see that many staffs. This would have to have that. This would be like for four pianos, really. Okay. So now you're talking about four pages per page, really, of stuff. I'm just asking speed up. No speed up. Over, over writing it by hand? Right. Over professional transcriber today. Well, uh, we probably ought to ask Chris. We're, remember, this is the composer. We're not competing with the... the uh, the transcriber. Uh, I guess I really don't know. I believe that it's uh, to get that quality of stuff. 
You're talking about getting something that, that looks like that, that you can print like that. Uh, I, I have no idea. When I said that it was 30 minutes per page, that's what I meant, scratching it out as fast as I could, barely readable. That was hand-scribbled copy. I have no idea what a, a real guy who does the kind of carving, maybe, Leland, do you know? Well, at least 30 minutes a page. For that stuff? Well, for this, the way it appears on the screen here would be more like 45 minutes to an hour a page for, for say, six uh, systems, or five systems. A stash, yeah. But as I say, we're really not trying to compete with the, the copyist. And also, this was really built in a very different way, as you see. It was entered here. It's really designed as a thing for the composer.